Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Restart Ed's virtual town hall number nine. I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Chuck Sampson, Superintendent, Freehold Regional High School District. So thank you, Kevin, and, and welcome everyone this evening. Uh, tonight's topic is teaching and learning in a remote and hybrid environment. And I'd first like to uh, welcome our panelists. We have a, an awesome group assembled for you this evening. Uh, first and foremost, we have Dr. Chris Tinkin from Seton Hall University. Uh, Chris has, has written more books and articles than you could possibly count. Uh, he's up to about 80 at this point in time. A well-known entity uh, in not just in the state, but nationally uh, for his work, particularly around curriculum. Uh, and most folks who've moved through the doctorate program at Seton Hall University have been carried on the back of Dr. Tinkin. So Chris, thank you for, for joining us this evening. We have Dr. Danita Ishibashi from Ewing Public Schools. Uh, Danita is uh, 34 years of educational experience, is the current assistant superintendent in the Ewing Public Schools, uh, has quite a broad range of uh, job titles there, Danita, that I saw. It was, uh, and the other, you know, is all probably added <laughs> on there. Um, but it, her Ed D from uh, UPenn, uh, I believe an undergraduate degree uh, from Westminster Choir College as well, mm -hmm. and, and a master's along the way there. Uh, and tons of experience that we're looking forward to, to hearing from tonight. So welcome, Danita. Thank you for, for your time. And then we have Jay Kenyon Cummings, uh, superintendent of the Wildwood Public Schools, uh, former special education teacher, building principal, current superintendent, uh, involved in a number of networks in the state, the SOS group, great schools, and as well as the Cape May County uh, presidency, right, of the, the roundtable there, Kenyon. So thank you for your time, Kenyon, and former teacher of the year as well, I might add. So. Thank you, Kenyon, for, for, for coming out this evening. Uh, and thank you everyone for tuning in. I'd like to give a special thanks to the Restart Ed team uh, working behind the scenes and they'll be in the chat room all night. We have Dr. David Adderhold, uh, superintendent of the West Windsor Public Schools. Uh, we have Dr. Jay Matchka, the uh, superintendent of the Matawan Aberdeen uh, Public Schools. Dr. Scott Rocco, uh, superintendent of the Hamilton Township Schools. Uh, and Dr. Mike Salvatore, uh, current superintendent, uh, past superintendent of the year, I should say, 2019 superintendent of the year in the state of New Jersey. Uh, so thank you everyone for, for coming out. And so obviously a incredibly timely topic this evening. Uh, all schools are looking forward to the reopening. Uh, there's certainly it's going to be in a hybrid, although I think most of us expect it to potentially be remote. A lot of angst mm -hmm. out there about what this might look like. And so having, having done this in the spring for several months, uh, the way I wanna frame this this evening is looking through the lens of continual improvement uh, and, and really bucketing it around equity, engagement, curriculum, and accountability, right? These are, these are, these are important topics to, to discuss. And so uh, I'm gonna start it off with just saying, you know, Danita, we'll, 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 we'll kick it to you to open the evening. Um, what are some of the lessons learned? So we know that the, the spring was, was hoisted upon us. Uh, it was all hands on deck and schools moved through that as effectively as possible. But looking back to the spring now and looking toward the, the reopening, I'm curious to hear, you know, what are some of those lessons learned that we're, we're gonna embrace as we head towards the fall? I think there are a couple of things. Um, I think the first thing was relationship building. You know, if you had strong relationships in the classroom, in kind of the brick setting, then when you move to that, that click setting, that virtual setting, teachers who had good relationships with students, students who had um, strong connections with teachers, most of them continued that connection in the virtual world. Uh, so making sure that there are those strong relationships and sometimes uh, you realize how strong the relationships may or may not have been. If students were just coming to class to be compliant, that kind of ritual compliance, and they weren't really engaged in the learning process, then those are the students who disconnected in the virtual world. So building those uh, relationships so that you can move students beyond this ritual compliance in the classroom. I think the other thing that we learned um, as we ended, uh, got to the core, end of the quarter was just some challenges around our concept and thinking around grading. So when you were in the classroom, homework and classwork seemed to be clearly defined. Participation seemed to be clearly defined. But when we were living in that virtual world, homework and classwork and participation were not as clearly defined. And we really needed to rethink um, 
our ideas of grading, why we were grading and what was going to be used in grading. So we learned that we need to think differently um, about that assessment component and then how we communicate to students. Uh, so I think those two things were the, the things that we struggled with the most um, and that we're, we really have to adjust and, and change as we enter the school year in September. I, I love the expression ritual compliance that I'm, I'm going to steal that, Danita. So thank you. Peter Schlechty. That's where I got it from. <laughs> uh, Chris, you, you know, you're, you've worked with a lot of schools over the past couple months as well, I know. So uh, thoughts on, on lessons learned as we, as we head to the fall? Sure. I think, I think uh, you know, one global lesson that we learned is that in general, you know, educators did an incredible job of making a transition, which mm -hmm. in some cases was basically over a weekend, right? They went home on a Friday and on Monday, they got the call that it's, we're, we're going remote. And so I think given that most educators had about 48 hours to get this going, the, the, um, the turnaround was, was incredible. So I'd like to just congratulate all the educators out there for a job well done. Um, the other thing that I, that I learned is a teacher cannot be replaced by a computer. As, as mm -hmm. Danita said, it's all about relationships. And you don't you don't have a personal relationship with a computer. So the teacher is the is the uh, the relationship maker, and it's a key factor. Is, is she he or she's a key factor in remote learning? Um, in terms of you know, in terms of the actual instructional component, I think a lot of teachers found that they had to redesign the lessons for for a remote environment specifically to provide more support. And what I mean by support is there's so many things that go on in a classroom, uh, teacher modeling, teacher direction, and those targeted little hints, those verbal hints to students when they get stuck. And then when we bring kids into a remote environment, a lot of times those things are not there. So I think what a lot of teachers learned, and I've seen a lot, and I've been working with schools on this, is to build in all of those supports, all of those live supports that exist when you're in the classroom, building those into your online remote lessons through embedded videos, embedded audio files, and just more sets of directions and examples. And especially for the parents. I think what we really found here is quality remote learning. Um, the parents and guardians are so important. They really do need to be partners, but we have to help them as educators. So building in tips and mm -hmm. prompts and more instructions for parents into our remote lessons, I think teachers who did that also had a better uh, a better experience and their students had a better experience. Thank you. Kenyon, any, uh, any thoughts on lessons learned? Yeah, I'll, I'll echo all those sentiments from uh, Danita and Chris, but also we learned very quickly, which we, we knew going into this that we weren't future ready, uh, mm -hmm. both in terms of the technology um, that we had to loan out, uh, the technology in the home, Wildwood is in a, an urban district, there's a very high poverty rate um, mm -hmm. locally. so. That was a challenge and not just in addition to not having the devices available to be able to deploy them, uh, we had that whole spectrum of understanding how to use them. So we had teachers that were very proficient in utilizing that technology and they, they enjoyed it and they were really uh, rock stars with it. And then we had some that had not really interacted with the Google suite or any kind of video conferencing technology, Google Classroom, et cetera, which meant that the exposure that our students had in those areas was very low as well. And then to, to Chris's point that the parents, if, if you haven't had children that work in those digital environments, mm -hmm. then you have a, an issue there as well. So um, our teachers did a great job like, figuring it out very quickly. They, they have an, a really good larger uh, professional learning community as, as a whole. So there was a lot of help and support there. Um, I think that as we head into this year, there's a strong chance that we're going to be remote immediately or very quickly. So we're now trying to assess what we need to do to make sure that we um, have the appropriate resources and training so that we can at least get past that, as well as the grading expectation, as well as um, any resources that can be out there. Like before we even begin the school year, kind of like if you ask districts to put a, a massive new plan for a new learning environment, mm -hmm. if you gave them the expectations first, that would be really helpful. So we're going to model that for our teachers as we head into this. Yeah, terrific points. I hope that um, I hope some of that empathy that followed the grading follows through in in, in the fall as well as, as as we move to those environments. 
Uh, Kenyon, you talked about it a little bit. You touched on it a little bit. Obviously, a, a huge issue with equity um, it, from access to support. The digital divide uh, nationally is, is significant. There are millions of children not connected uh, to the internet. Um, and in this day and age, uh, obviously, as we look to be either remote or hybrid, and one of the points that I make is we expect to be in both, right? So school districts need to have rich programs developed for both remote and hybrid. Mm -hmm. But in terms, of, in, in, in terms of equity and some of these real, real dilemmas we're facing, and, and I'll open with you, Ken, you know, you know what, are some of the, what are some of the solutions for the fall so that we, 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 we pivot a little bit more quickly than some places we're able to during the spring? Well, we will be in a position, it, it looks like, to be able to go one-to-one -one for the opening of school. And uh, one of the things we're going to do is even in the early childhood and kindergarten programs is try to get devices for parents to utilize just to access the assignments that we can put together because learning is much more hands-on and one-to-one -one at that level. Um, it's still unclear utilizing surveys to really determine who has real internet access in the homes. So we're hoping that um, partnering with the teachers in finding out who's not able to connect, we'll be able to figure that and um, get a read on it and deploy hotspots and help parents with connectivity there. Uh, our challenge, the uh, Ed Law Center put out an article recently in one of their email blasts about just the overcrowding in urban districts and how that hasn't been addressed over time. Uh, there are districts in the state that are gonna be able to go five days a week that, are, that have a very different demographic than ours. And we have a, uh, we're in a city that has historically had one of the number one poverty ratings for students that are school age in the state of New Jersey. Although our volume isn't as big as some of the other bigger urban centers, um, that's a real issue for us. We already have unhoused students. So as far as the, um, the hybrid environment goes, it's been very challenged to, challenging to build that. Um, and make it equitable in comparison to the, uh, the access and the opportunity that students have across the state. Okay. Chris, Chris, thoughts on equity? Yeah, so I want to frame equity just first from a, from a national perspective. Um, you know, the National Center of Education Statistics put out some data right before the pandemic that, um, you know, they said about 94% of students had internet access. But within, you know, when you start to look at that statistic and you dig a little bit deeper, um, out of that 94%, uh, 6% only had it through a smartphone, right? Mm -hmm. And so now we're down to about 88% of kids. And we know smartphones aren't optimal for teaching or learning. So we're looking at about right. 6.8 million kids across the country who did not have adequate um, internet access. Mm -hmm. And then just to dig a little bit deeper, um, that those lines of access really cut across racial and socioeconomic mm -hmm. lines. Uh, for example, only about 3% of uh, white students had to rely on smartphones for internet access, you know, wh whereas uh, 10 and 11% of uh, Hispanic and black students. Um, if you lived in a house where a parent only had a high school diploma, uh, the 17% of those households didn't have internet access. So the equity issue is goes beyond you know, the education realm, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's more of a societal piece that we really need to, to look at. But I think what educators have been doing, right, I think they've been responding using their sphere of influence, just like Kenyon said, trying to get devices, working to get uh, internet access for students. So uh, the educators have really, I think they've really taken on the responsibility that should, should lie at the state and national level, and they're helping to, to fill the void there. Um, but, it, but I want to go beyond the access issue because a lot of people equate equity with access and that's just, that's only half of the, uh, half of the story. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more about the support that students have once they have that mm -hmm. access. So regardless if everybody has a, a computer and everybody has high speed internet, the game is really on the support side. So I think what, another thing that we saw was that remote learning requires kind of this at elbow support for both students and parents and guardians. And that's the kind of support that, you know, it's immediately available um, in the home. So when a student doesn't know how to, you know, manipulate something on the computer or doesn't understand mm -hmm. a concept, 
Uh, in homes where that support is immediate, you get different results compared to homes where maybe p parents are working two jobs, non-standard hours, and that support's not there. So what we, how that relates to engagement is when support is not timely, okay, students become frustrated, they disengage, and then they underachieve. So remote learning is so dependent on those factors outside of the control of, of school. I think we really need, schools really need to start focusing on how can they build more support into the lessons that they, uh, the lessons that they deliver. So Janita, I heard uh, a lot of affirmation to some of the points that yes. Chris was making there. So, you know, how, how are you tackling some of the equity issues in Ewing? Um, well, you know, we are a diverse district. We have uh, 21 different languages within our district. We are close to 50% of our students on free and reduced lunch. So we have both linguistic diversity, cultural diversity, socioeconomic diversity um, in our district. So I agree with what has been said. This issue of, of equity um, is about access. Um, it's not just about giving students a device. I mean, we did a survey and we asked students or asked families how they're children were completing their work. And I was surprised, even though we distributed Chromebooks to over a thousand family, the number of students who said they used their cell phone to complete their work, yeah. even though we offered them the Chromebook device. So um, it, it isn't just about giving them the device. It's really also about shifting the mindset about using the technology uh, that the district is providing and then making sure that all of the supports are around for the students as well as for the family. And that's kind of a mindset shift um, that we have to work on and not assume that just because you have a device and we gave you a hotspot that you are now going to be able to log in every day and do your work. Because the other part of equity is making sure that students can access it. And some of the students uh, in our families had difficulty accessing it because there were multiple children trying to get on a device or trying to use the hotspot. And sometimes things didn't get done or, things, or students didn't have a place to actually do their work. So um, I, I believe it's not just about the device. And that's something that teachers have to think about too. When you have a student who's using a hotspot, if for some reason that hotspot isn't working, because we found that hotspots are not always reliable. You know, what is the other support that's gonna be available for the student and what accommodation is going to be met so that we do have the opportunity for all students to access the learning and demonstrate their learning. So giving them the technology isn't always enough if you also don't have that mindset that you're gonna make sure that access um, is always provided to students, whether they are using that device or not. Yeah, you know, t terrific points, and, and what we're seeing, you know, I think the uh, most recent unemployment number is 1.2 million additional folks on unemployment, uh, food scarcity becoming much more prevalent. Uh, we've seen a real uptick in the, in the folks looking for devices and hotspots. Uh, the cable providers aren't quite so generous in the fall as they were in the spring, and so we're navigating that as well. Uh, and there's got to be pressure, uh, not just at the state, but the national level. And uh, I, I'll, I'll plug uh, hashtag connect kids now. It's a national effort to pressure the FCC to do something about this. And uh, mm -hmm. a group of superintendents from across the country have come together around that issue. Mm -hmm. And it has not been solved. Uh, we're heading to the fall and, and we know that uh, the, the, the utilization of technology and the access and the support for it are gonna be even more important uh, because it's not like teachers knew their students like they did in March when we went remote, right? There's gonna be a very good mm -hmm. chance uh, that those relationships are going to need to be built online uh, and, and really mm -hmm. parsing who needs what. It's going to be some real work. Um, Chris, you mentioned a little bit about engagement and, um, you know, student voice is, is, is incredibly important in all this and, and uh, often it's, it's been lacking in some of the reopening plans that I've seen in terms of uh, digging into what, what the students really think about their experience and what that looks like. And I read a, a recent um, survey today from a colleague sent me that they polled 13,000 students and they said they were much, much more engaged when they had some face time with their teachers in this remote world, right? And so what, what is it, how do we engage, how do we help our teachers who are managing potentially a hybrid environment with kids at home, kids in the classroom, real difficult, we're putting a lot on the backs of our teachers, we know that, right? So how are we managing student engagement in all of this in the fall? Okay, so I think the, the, the point you bring up is a good one. Students are the least 
consulted people in the education process. Uh, we write curriculum, we, we buy programs, we buy resources, and um, usually the voice that's not included in that is the student. So I think, first of all, we need to talk to kids. Um, and, you know, teachers are the first point of contact, and it, that's a great opportunity to, for them to talk about topics that interest their students so that they can repackage what's basically a static curriculum into interesting topics. Now, look, you know, elementary school teachers do this all the time. They do, they do projects, they do themes, okay? And I think we just need to get the student voice into what kinds of topics, what kinds of projects they wanna do. That's a good first start. And then again, going back to what I said about, we have to, we have to really look at the way that we design our remote lessons so that there's engagement built into there. And so there's, there's some specific templates that are actually out there. And I'll, I'll drop a, a link to one in, in the chat bar later. Some of you might already be using the 5E model, you know, mm -hmm. explore, explain, extend, um, engage. And so that's basically a lesson planning template for a remote, for a remote environment that uh, includes an engagement piece in each of those five E's. So students encounter, content in an interesting way and then they respond and react uh, and interact with content in an interesting way so sometimes just giving uh, teachers some templates and some guides on how to break down a remote lesson and what should go in it I think if we do that you know the teachers are going to use their educational imaginations mm -hmm. and come up with the with the good stuff but I think we do need to help them with some structures because this is all uh, very new. Again, another big difference in a remote environment, we really have to chunk the volume of material that yes. kids interact with. You know, kids open up an assignment, and if that Google, that Google Doc or that Google Slideshow is just packed with material, well, that's an engagement buster right there. Because as a student, I look at that and I say, wow, you know, that, that's a lot of work. So what we want, we want to approach kids with less is more, okay? Um, so think about designing lessons that are meaningful, based on topics that kids are interested in and cut out, cut out the trivial stuff. Just get down to those threshold skills and have kids be active through projects and problem-based activities where they actually take action and do something with the material. Indeed, I'm curious. Uh, so, so Chris is talking about, um, you know, some real processes to help, help teachers engage students. Uh, viewing public schools, what does what, what the student voice look like for you there? What have your students told you about their experiences and, and, and how might you be integrating that into what the reopening looks like in the fall? You know, our students uh, in the spring of the year uh, was communicating to us a lot about what they thought about the, the virtual learning and, and the impact. Um, we could always use a little bit more student voice um, I think uh, reaching out to students for some people is a, a scary thing <laughs> um, because uh, maybe you don't want to hear what's going to be said. So it's better not to ask. Mm -hmm. um, I had the opportunity to visit some student presentations uh, virtually, and I was amazed at a social studies project which was researching uh, on the pandemic. And students were sharing their feelings about it, what they learned about it, how it was impacting their lives. They were looking at it from a historical standpoint and every student had something to say. Um, and it was a very powerful experience for me to hear what was going on in students' minds and in a way in their hearts. And it really impacted some of the conversations I had afterwards. So I think it is important for us to, to reach out to our students. Um, and I think they will also tell us what they want in the design of lessons. You know, for the most part, I think our students really want to be engaged. They're just looking for somebody to actually capture their imagination and give them the opportunity to move forward. Um, it's a little bit more challenging to do in the virtual world, but it doesn't mean that it's impossible to do if you change uh, your mindset. It's about finding topics that you can use as a vehicle to get the knowledge to the students that you want them to gain and give them an opportunity to demonstrate it, which means you have to think a little bit differently about how to engage them. So um, you need to talk to your students. It's back to that relationship. So they will tell you 
what they need, whether they're five or 15, they don't really have a problem telling you what they need as long as you are open to listening to it and take it as part of the learning process and not something personal and then move on to really deal with those issues of equity and engagement, which really should be um, equal and in the forefront and how people are planning. Chef, can I jump in? Danita, Danita brought up some, a lot of good points that I wanna piggyback on. Um, if I could ride her coattails for a little bit here. Um, you know, in, in terms of the engagement, there, there's that piece also where, you know, we, we have to chunk things mm -hmm. in short periods of time for students. So I'm thinking, you know, if you're having kids doing the same thing for more than 10 minutes, you, right. you are, you're definitely going, you're definitely shooting for low engagement. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we want to keep things moving in our lessons. Another thing teachers can do, um, and, and Danita was kind of getting at this. If we spend all our time pushing kids towards assignments that have predetermined answers, they never are able to bring in their own experiences and their own thoughts. So a quick audit that a teacher can do is just go through his or her assignments and look to see if there's any area in those assignments where original thinking can be put forward. And in terms of original thinking, a quick way to just to know when you have it is, you know, it's a question you can ask 20 students and you can get 20 different answers and they can all be correct. That's original mm -hmm. thinking. And it's also higher level thinking. So we really want to make sure inside those assignments, we have pockets of original thinking where kids can, can put some of this predetermined knowledge to use in a way that fits them. And so then we're talking about differentiation by product, where we offer students different ways to show what they know. So when you start to put this together with these, these 5e lesson structures and some of these other things, you have original thinking, you have differentiation by product, you have support at elbow support through videos, audio files, directions. Now it's a whole different ball game. Okay, because students, we, uh, to, to Danita's point about engagement and Schlechty, the highest level of engagement is when we have assignments that students want to do because they want to do it, not because they have to do it. So we're trying to get to make assignments that are going to uh, capture kids' interest, but then support them when they're inside that assignment with at elbow resources. So, so terrific points from both of you. And uh, here we are, 2020 in a pandemic, and I want to hand everybody a copy of Dewey. Right, and, and read <laughs> yeah. some Dewey, uh, and integrate some of those thoughts in with with the technology of 2020, and what fantastic things we would do. Right, Kenyon, uh, thoughts on on engagement uh, from Wildwood and from your own experiences here as we look toward the fall. Yeah, to to the earlier points about chunking and the length of assignments, I think that um, what well, I know that one of the things that we heard from our students was just the the volume of work initially, and I saw it with my own. Two, I have two sons in middle school. Because I think we like, we want to be compliant. We want to make sure that we meet the, the the like the physical guidelines that are out there. So teachers felt like that four hour number had to be at least satisfied. And I think that turned into some busy work for students. And we heard that from our own students. And I saw that with my sons. Mm -hmm. um, heading into the fall, we we have like a, a new a potential new model doing the hybrid. So we're either going to be remote, we're going to be hybrid, and hopefully soon we'll be all back in 100%. So when I was talking about trying to figure out expectations, that's something that we need to hear from students also, because in our model, we'll have the cohorts for two days, we'll be remote for a day, and then the other cohort will come in. Uh, so it's really 50-50 split down the center. But we know how to do in-person instruction, but what are we gonna do with the three days of virtual learning? And what are the expectations gonna be? How do you get credit for attendance? How do you get credit for assignments? And how does that weigh in? And the best teachers set their classroom rules on day one at like a democracy within the classroom somewhat. So that's one of the things that we've been talking about, um, just getting the student voice in there. And I think as professionals, like that's the other piece that we've been talking about. Our principals have been uh, trying to develop virtual codes of conduct for students and for uh, faculty. So I think we need to model uh, that expectation to students as well. So I think if we're remote, I think we should be as we are remote right now. We're all professionally uh, presented, like we can hear each other well, we can see each other on camera. If we're using presentation materials, the room is well lit, lit. we're engaging. Um, that's one piece. And then as far as engagement goes, uh, the discussion now, because we, we're pretty, our plans in review right now. So we wanted to spend the rest of the summer discussing on how to do the remote environment better. So the, the idea is if we've already split the district into cohorts of A and B, 
can we begin there to talk about what we're going to do virtually? So already the, the Google Meet is half the size. So you're managing half the mm -hmm. students. And then if you're using uh, breakout rooms or smaller rooms mm -hmm. following that, like whole group instruction, and then as we would within that environment, can we then break those groups down even more to make it more engaging and more individualized and get as close as to the elbow elbow component that Chris was talking about. And then I think that we really need to listen to our faculty as well, because I think that we're going to start hearing about new opportunities as we get more nimble in that mm -hmm. space with our pedagogy. So uh, I've said it before and I've heard uh, you as well, Chuck, like some of the best things that we've implemented in our systems have been the result of just stopping and listening to a good idea for mm -hmm. five minutes. So a lot of credit to give out to people. And that's what I'm hoping to look forward to is uh, hear some of that innovation and support and facilitate that and share it. Yeah, thank you. You know, so uh, as one of the things that I'm seeing very, very recently, uh, a lot of fear around uh, learning loss, right? Like my, my child is falling behind. Can I take a gap year? Can I repeat this grade? Um, and I'm wondering, uh, I'd like to hear from the panelists, what, what are your thoughts on what we are or are not losing in terms of the, the, the student experience uh, in this environment? And Janita, I'll, I'll, I'll open with you on that one. You know, I think the concern about learning loss is when people are um, so focused on a standard and they say, oh, I didn't cover this standard, therefore there is a loss. Right. And just because you didn't cover a standard or maybe you didn't cover to the depth in which you did in the past or in the same way that you did in the past doesn't necessarily mean loss. So students may not have experienced the depth, but it doesn't mean that there wasn't learning that happened in the spring. It also depends on how you define and measure what student learned. Right. So I know that students had knowledge in June that they didn't have in March. It's a matter of how you measure it. So as we're moving forward, I think this is a great opportunity to really look at your curriculum and say, what really is the essence of what I need students to learn? Where is it in the curriculum? And all of the things that really don't contribute to that, but they're the, the fun activities because it's something that we can do and it makes kids smile, to really focus on what is the most meaningful learning that students can gain about this content area that they can apply within the content area or cross it into somewhere else. So once you go back and look at your curriculums, I think you're gonna find if you are open-minded enough, and, and that's the hard thing, right? Is having this open mind to say, let's go back in our curriculum and take out all of the things that are the favorite things we wanna do, but really focus on the meaningful learning. And then how can we translate that meaningful learning into an engaging way um, using all of the benefits of the technology that's available to us. So it's an opportunity to actually, um, in a way, kind of pull the weeds out of the curriculum so the flowers can grow and we can promote that learning. But it does require a very different mindset and being willing to let go of some things so that you can actually do some things deeper. And I think in the end, instead of having learning lost, we can actually have learning gains by being this, this environment but we are gonna to have to um, lose uh, some of our kind of traditional thinking um, and open up our minds to something different. Yeah, you know, terrific points. And uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm bringing to folks is that, that documentary from Scarsdale High School from a few years ago called Losing Ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it was kids who were headed to Harvard and they were asking them basically what they learned the previous year. And, and what came out was they had memorized everything, they had plowed mm -hmm. through in these high level classes, they didn't really learn much, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think this is an opportunity to dig a little bit deeper and, and be a little bit more, have a little bit more clarity around what's important in the curriculum uh, and focus there. Uh, Chris, what do, you, what do you say to, uh, you know, the parent that, you know, says my child is, is, has fallen behind? Uh, what can we do to teachers who are fearful of not covering the curriculum or meeting the expected standards? Uh, and finally, the administrators who are, you know, teachers are fearful that administrators will play the I gotcha game around covering curriculum. So, so how do you make sense of all of that for the fall? Yeah, so I think, I think you really do need to go on a standards diet. Um, there's, so, you know, just, just, uh, just re rewind a little bit. In terms of how the Common Core came about and the NJSLS that's based on the Common Core and even the new 
Uh, I just got done going through all the new revisions that came out on June 3rd. Um, a lot of the standards that are in there uh, fall into two buckets. Number one is they can, um, they can be achieved through artificial intelligence, also known as a Google search. And number two, uh, they're special, a lot of them are special interest standards. Okay. And what mm -hmm. I mean by that is they come from a, you know, a group or, or a small group of people who think this is something that's going to be important for kids to learn now when it's really not. And so these things just kind of get in the way. So uh, to echo Danita, I think you really need to go through your curriculum and, 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 and carve out that curriculum into two buckets, the must haves. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, I, and what I mean by must haves, I mean, you know, when kids walk out of your school a, at the end of that year, what are the skills and not only the skills, but the dispositions, right. Mm -hmm. That are going to help them to be better people and navigate the world, not navigate school, not, 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 not just do school, but navigate the world. And I think what you're going to find is that bucket isn't going to have many standards in it. Um, because there's not many threshold standards. There's just a few things we need to do and do well. And then all the other stuff is kind of like the nice to have. And mm -hmm. if we can fit that in, yeah, we can sprinkle in some nice to have. Um, but, you know, I'm not sure that every student needs to know author's purpose at third grade. I, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know about that. I, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, so. But it's up to the school to determine those, those threshold skills. But think long term and think about those skills that kids can use in, um, you know, in, in real life. The other thing is, I, I don't like this idea of we're, we're losing learning or we're falling behind. That's a deficit model. Why don't we start talking about discovering what kids can do? We spend so much time telling kids what they, what they can't do. Let's, why don't we spend some time discovering what they can do and then building off of those strengths and catapulting off of those strengths. Thank you. Kenyon, any thoughts on, are you grappling with this in Wildwood at all? Any challenges? Yeah, we, we've discussed this quite a bit. And I, I think that at different levels, it has different impacts. So it's a pre-K to 12 environment where we are. Um, I am optimistic that, that I don't want to like speak to a deficit model at all, but uh, we do know that the type of instruction and the quality of instruction is not the same as being in person. And uh, teachers who have been in the same assignment for multiple years, they get into patterns and they get into routines, not to say that they're not unhealthy or that they're, they're, they are unhealthy, but they get that it's predictable for them. It's September. I'm going to pull the September bin and then we'll focus on these ideas, these lessons, these activities. Those, that's part of the mindset thinking that we have to address when we have our, our teachers back in the fall. Uh, that's what we've talked about addressing through PD. Our first three days will be PD now um, to address a lot of the other things with health and safety, Chromebooks, et cetera. Um, but I think that what we need to do is really get, rely heavily on the relationships in between teachers there needs to be a lot of vertical sharing of lesson plans and activities uh, so that once we can get a true assessment of our students and figure out where they are so we can begin where they are and build upon that, I think then they can, we have resources available and working together, we can come up with a path forward. And I think implementing some of the things that were just shared, which I have more notes of what I learned today than what I, I aim to share. Um, I think if we can implement some of those things and make sure that teachers understand that there's going to be a lot of flexibility for these concepts as we get back so that they're it's more of a, a support model than an accountability and gotcha model um, that we're all in this together and it's not going to be perfect and we're going to have to learn from some failures i think if we can create that environment then some good things can happen yeah i, I love the um i love the term standards diet uh mm -hmm. you know in, in, in education uh, we don't we don't embrace those stop doings enough I think that's mm -hmm. a real a real uh, issue for public ed in general, that we continue in doing what we've always done, and regardless <laughs> of the environment, regardless of the, the circumstances changing to our own detriment, and ultimately to the detriment of our students, uh, when we don't uh, draw a hard line in the sand about some of these things that need to go away, right? Um, and we have a hard time letting go of things. We love to grab on to new, uh, not so much let go, what's, what might not be as effective uh, and, and thinking of the, the new school year, uh, you know, the Secretary of Ed has, uh, has hinted that uh, there won't be uh, a, a waiver from standardized testing and the such, and those accountability measures for kids. Um, certainly worried about uh, what the class of 2021, those graduation requirements, 
Uh, any thoughts, and Chris, I'll, I'll open with you on, on, on some of the, the accountability measures that schools are gonna be facing in the fall uh, and how we can best and most effectively manage them for our, for our students and our communities. Okay, well, just in terms of standardized testing, let's just take the state, any state's standardized test, whatever, whatever state you, you work in, those, those standardized tests are constructed under a set of assumptions, okay? And so the results are only valid if those assumptions are met. So one assumption that a standardized test is constructed under is called the opportunity to learn. It's assumed that all students will have the same opportunity to learn the content that is being assessed on the state test. So just that principle alone raises questions to me that when you know every district across the state, they're all using different schedules to go into the fall. Some kids are in school one day a week. Some kids are in school five days a week. Some kids are in school for four hours. Some kids are in school in six hours. Where is the universal opportunity mm -hmm. to learn there? So right away, um, there's, there's inequities and that assumption is not gonna be met. So then when you get the results back, the results aren't gonna tell you what students know or how good the teacher taught. Um, they're, gonna, they're probably gonna tell you maybe more about the time that the student actually spent in school versus out of school. That's one thing. Now, the one thing they always tell you is the zip code of where the student lives because standardized tests don't measure what students know. They measure out of school factors. They're highly contaminated by out of school factors. They're a very, very blunt measure. And so that's why we really don't wanna use them to make, we don't wanna use them to make important decisions. In fact, at Seton Hall, Chuck, you know this, we've been, doing, we've been doing studies for the past eight years, predicting people's test scores around the country using just their community demographics. That's not a knock on teachers and educators, that's a knock on the way standardized tests are constructed. So they're not constructed to measure those granular, those granular issues. So um, I don't see how a state can justify giving standardized tests in the spring because the results aren't going to tell you anything about what's going on in schools because kids are going to be all over the place in terms of the amount of time they're in school and, and, uh, and, and, and the way that they're receiving education. So I, you know, and I know te teachers worry about this and schools worry about this. Um, I really would just focus on providing high quality instruction at the best level that I can. The standardized test chips are going to fall where they fall and they're not going to be valid indicators of what really happened. Anita, any, any thoughts on some of these accountability measures as we move into the, uh, the fall? I'm also um, curious about teacher evaluation and what that might look like in this world. I know there's a lot of angst there as well from, mm -hmm. uh, from the faculty and staff across not just the state, but the nation in terms of how they might be evaluated in all of this if some of these other measures remain uh, to some of the points that Chris just made. I think um, I agree with the, the standardized assessments. You know, anytime you give an assessment, you always want to ask, what is the purpose of the assessment? What are you going to learn about student learning? And what are students going to learn about their own learning? When you look at the state assessment, especially now that we have all of these different schedules happening in school, the question really is, what is the purpose of the assessment? What are we going to get out of it? And then how are we going to use that in information in a productive way to, in, to inform our instructional practice. So um, on the one hand, I understand the politics of I need to be concerned about the assessments, but I am much more uh, concerned and will be more concerned about our local assessments where we are going to measure uh, students' learning, where we want to provide students the opportunity to make their learning and thinking visible so that we can adjust our instructional practice. Um, and I think that's the shift that we're gonna have to make as we are living in a very different type of instructional world. Um, connected to that will be the evaluation system for uh, teachers. Still waiting for some state guidance there, but many of the things that we expected in person, I think we can expect um, in a virtual world, you're still going to look at the decisions uh, that are made about the choice of resources, uh, the delivery of instruction, meeting the needs of students, um, having cognitive engagement on the students. We may not have that hands-on engagement that we've always talked about, but we can look at cognitive engagement. We can look at uh, the quality of the feedback and the assessments and the measurement of student learning. All of those broad areas are going to be visible in virtual teaching. And in fact, 
um, it may be a better place to really see the creativity of teachers addressing those student needs um, and adjusting their practice. I think the other thing we have to remember is no matter how many years experience you have in the classroom, as soon as you walk in the virtual world, we're all like first year teachers and first year administrators. It doesn't really matter how many years you're bringing in because you're teaching in a completely different environment than you have in the past. So like a first year teacher, give yourself a break and a pass, take a deep breath, and understand that everyone is learning, teaching, teachers and administrators, and, and let's talk about our practice and have those meaningful conversations. Let's get rid of that accountability and that feeling of somebody has got you um, and see if we can work together to help ourselves professionally and therefore help our students. Can you? Okay, okay, Chris. No, I, wanna, I, wa I wanna speak uh, to the teachers a little bit about the standardized testing, because I know sometimes teachers get concerned about it and they're worried that their kids are not learning and they, they may look to those results for information about how well their students learning. But I just want to tell the teachers that they are the ultimate assessment engine, okay? Mm -hmm. they, they, they can't be replaced by a standardized test. And so what they, I think what teachers should think about um, is think about the three-legged stool of data, okay? When we want to make important decisions about how kids are learning, let's try to use three data points. So let's just take reading comprehension and specifically, let's take inferential comprehension. We want to have three data points on inferential comprehension about the students. So three different ways to look at that that aren't standardized mm -hmm. tests. Um, and the best way to do that is in the classroom. And then another reason you want to do it in the classroom is because for any instrument to be diagnostic, okay, to mm -hmm. really tell student strengths and weaknesses at the individual level, you got to have 20 to 25 questions per specific skill. Most mm -hmm. of the standardized, well, none of the standardized tests around the country right. have that. Most standardized tests around the country have three to eight questions max mm -hmm. on each skill. So they're not diagnostic. So what we want to do is we want to empower teachers to take assessment into their own hands because that's where assessment, assessment actually happens at the point of contact at the desk. And just work with teachers to give them ideas, three different ways for some of these threshold skills. So once you identify and, 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 put, and go on that standards diet, identify those threshold skills, then come up with an internal assessment system and three, three ways to assess those uh, threshold skills. And I know that um, uh, Mr. Cummings has been doing a lot of work in Wildwood with an internal assessment system that is high, highly reliable and it actually gives teachers actionable data. So I don't know if, if uh, I can take over the hosting here and throw it to him or, <laughs> or maybe Chuck has to do kick, that. Kick but, it over, Chris. You know, Go ahead. Somebody, I think, I think, I think Mr. Cummings needs to talk about the assess the internal assessment system that he built, you know, starting about 10 years ago and how that thing runs on a three-legged stool of data and what they're getting out of it. Yes. So again, I have to defer some credit to Dr. Tinkin because he assisted us with our data sources long ago. Uh, this is my 14th year in uh, district and we built those assessment systems at the elementary level and later scaled them through the middle and parts of the high school. So we, we do benchmark uh, reading, writing, and mathematic concepts tri triannually uh, within the classroom, and we're able to get a picture of where students are um, at any given moment. So that's much more reliable than waiting a year to figure out what the standardized assessment's going to say. And with, with the fact that like our students, um, we know now it's well documented. We've had these things for over two decades just from NCLB. We know that they're predictors of household income, which I spoke about earlier in the, in the demographics in Wildwood. And that's not to say that people aren't trying. Like we have a lot of hardworking parents and multiple jobs. So it's, it's just about like access and the ability and skill set and what we can do with our children and the time that we have available to do anything with them when we're relying on siblings and, and grandparents for childcare, et cetera. Um, that said, I think that it's very, like, for lack of a better word, I think it's silly to try to institute any kind of standardized assessment this year. I think that it's, it's egregious that we haven't told this cohort of high school students how they're going to graduate high school. I mm -hmm. think that should be cleared up. I think that we need guidance on if there's going to be a significant portion of remote instruction, how are we going to evaluate our teachers? Because we have teachers that we hired last year that we may not have been able to finish all three evaluations for. So we need to get a, a real assessment of, of how they're doing and what they need. Um, to that point, the uh, school accountability measures, which I've been a part of for a long time, going back to CAPA through the RAC, 
now uh, the Office of Comprehensive Support. Uh, my elementary principal, he shared today that they're still expecting the school level plans as part of that accountability <laughs> measure. Now I can tell you that um, the, 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 the support and the assistance we were supposed to get out of those uh, initiatives never came. It was a lot of distraction. It was a lot of unnecessary noise. And that noise is now being compounded by what the expectation is of schools at the central building and classroom and family level, that we need all the space possible and opportunity possible to do this new version of an instruction and education the right way. And to, to let teachers know like, how they're gonna be evaluated, there's a set like the, the SGOs and the MSGP scores are all based on that same assessment data. So like those are things we can do. We can do that now. So that's something that, that I brought up from time to time. I'm, I obviously have some deep wounds as a result of it, but I think it's time that, that we at least make some decisions on that on behalf of kids. Mm -hmm. Well, well, well stated. And so in, in about seven minutes, this panel just completely debunked the very basis upon which <laughs> schools are evaluated posted against one another publicly uh, and dissected uh, artificially from the public and from the Department of Ed, right? And, and we all know that as practitioners. And uh, I, I think we have a responsibility. And, and, you know, I use a lot of the things that, that, that Chris really espoused at Seton Hall with my own grad students. When you send them off on a project to look at what a school community looks like, a vision project, they come right back with the state assessment data and present that as if that tells you what those children can or cannot do. Uh, and so we're conditioned in a way that is incredibly problematic to, to, to feed into that. Uh, and so stepping off of that, I saw in, in, in the chat room there, I do think it's important uh, for, for all of us to stand up for uh, sort of the nonsense of, of maintaining some of these other processes in the midst of what is a disrupted year to, to, to begin with. And, and I think uh, I, I use the phrase, it's, a, it's a, an abdication of leadership under the guise of flexibility, right? That's what we're all experiencing right now. So we all have all the flexibility we want. Uh, but what that's going to be is 600 different experiences uh, for hundreds of thousands of different students across the state. Uh, and I think that puts us in a really dangerous place, right? Um, and so I, I, I appreciate your thoughts on standardized assessment. Um, what, what, does anybody, um, what does anybody tell the classroom teacher starting September? Danita, I thought that was a terrific point. We're all new in this, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is new to all of us. We don't have the experience as, uh, as administrators. A lot of my team laments the fact that they never taught in this. And so that's mm -hmm. difficult to, to be as empathetic as you would want. But I would ask if you're giving teachers one word of advice uh, for the fall of 2020, Kenyon, what, what is it? I, I just think that we, we have to work together and it's not gonna be perfect. Mm -hmm. But if we, if we put our best effort forward and we work together and we communicate, we can create a, a new and uh, impactful, positive opportunity for our kids. Chris, thoughts on, on what you might tell a, a, a teacher? One, one, one phrase, one word of advice for the fall. Yeah, don't let perfect get in the way of better. Anita? I'm going to say, um, you know, we all learn through our mistakes. So make a mistake early, learn as much as you can early, and let that guide you for the rest of the year. So in, 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 in taking up the, the sum of um, equity, engagement, accountability, access, different scheduling constraints that districts are all, are all beholden to, um, I think one thing that the pandemic has laid bare uh, is how absolutely atrocious the infrastructure of our school systems are, <laughs> the funding for our school systems, Delta Airlines gets $5 billion, uh, you know, and, and more than the, 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 the sum of K-12 across the, the country. Uh, it's, it's, it's an absolute just abdication of our, our, you know, what we need to be doing for our children. Uh, but that's where we are. And so we know we're going to navigate this in, in the fall. Um, closing thoughts on, on the best way to do that. Uh, Chris, I'll, I'll start with you. You know, what how do schools approach just 
managing all of this for the long haul, understanding that we expect to be uh, both remote and hybrid at different points in time, especially during those first several months of the 2020-21 school year. So I guess I want to end this with kind of like a, a mindset idea. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's time that educators realize that they need to take control. They have the skill set and the power to take control. We have to stop waiting for other people to come mm -hmm. in and solve the problem. They're not coming. No one is coming. We, we, <laughs> no, we are the someone. Okay. And so I think we, we just need to take it uh, by the horns and, 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 and do what we know is right for students and stop waiting for other people to tell us what to do because, because we're the experts. We need to do what's right and we just need to move forward and do it. Stop, stop waiting. Anita? I think this is a great opportunity to do in education what we've been talking about for a long time. We've talked about minimizing the curriculum and not being so wet to standards. So we have the perfect opportunity in this unfortunate situation to do that. So let's release in our mind the walls of a building and rethink learning without walls because that's what it is in a virtual world. And let's just take advantage of this opportunity to learn together. The learning in our buildings are not relegated you know, to those under the age of 18. It's now really relegated to those of us over 21 or more to really learn uh, new things by uh, releasing the walls in our minds and then doing something that's actually gonna leverage learning for our students. Kenyon? Well, all this is, you hear a lot about how traumatic it is as we go into this. And it's like the, the faculty, there's a, there's a lot of unknowns for them. We have incongruent guidance of what the rules are for society and what we're going to do with schools in the fall. Um, but I think that we all also have to have a shared understanding of how uh, the, the, the level of trauma for kids is affecting mm -hmm. them as well. So this is traumatic also, like in, in urban communities, the one thing that's always consistent is who's going to meet them at the door in the morning and begin the day. Like you can guarantee that that's going to be the same thing every day. You're going to have normal meals. You're going to have normal uh, structures and schedules. Um, so I think if, if we head into this understanding uh, that if we have a, an understanding of that trauma and the, the experience of our children and the unknowns that we're going to learn about when we get them back, I think that's really important. And our best work has come from just caring about kids in the beginning. If we care about our students and, and we're worried about what their experience is, I think uh, if they're at the center of our decision-making, my mentor who, uh, who was in Wildwood prior to me, Dennis Anderson, that was his guidance. Like if you make decisions with students at the center, you're mm -hmm. always gonna have a positive outcome. And I think if we keep our mindset there and we do that together, we will have a positive outcome. So, so some powerful points, and, and I would point out to the folks on the call and to the panel, you know, the whole, the whole existence of this Restart Ed uh, experience is, is, is uh, enough of us having enough of uh, a lack of guidance and input and say and saying, you know what, we're going to do it ourselves, and we're going to branch out, we're going to create something uh, that ampl amplifies the voice of individuals that are really pushing positive change. Uh, and so I thank all of you for being a part of that. And I would say to anybody who's uh, watching the video and been on the call, uh, you know, tell some of your friends to, to come on to the calls. I mean, we're doing this every Thursday night at eight o'clock. Uh, next week, we're, 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 we're talking about caring for ourselves and caring for others. Uh, and to the trauma that Kenyon just talked about, uh, I think it'll be a great session on that. Uh, and Chris, to your point about the, you know, no one's coming to help us, mm -hmm. agree 100%. And that's why, mm -hmm. Uh, folks like you who take the time to come out and share your expertise with, uh, with, with the rest of the world and we're able to amplify your voice and, and I love that uh, we're able to give you that platform and I hope that we can continue to do that and I would just thank all three of you for some incredible contributions today. Uh, I've got so many little sound bites uh, that, I, that I wrote down that everybody said that I will be stealing. I'll give you credit. <laughs> I'll give you all credit uh, but at some point I'll be utilizing uh, some of these phrases. And so I want to thank the, uh, the folks that tuned in tonight. Uh, I want to thank our, our panelists, Danita, Kenyon, and Chris. Fantastic. Uh, and we will see everyone again next Thursday at eight o'clock. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Stay well. Good night. Thank, thank you. you.